Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. Listening to the GSMC Sci Fi Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network and hosted today by Keith. Um, and today is the day we should all be really excited. Uh, we are finally finishing our discussion on the fall of Hyperion. Um, it's been a long time coming to get through the second book. Um, I think at this point, I am just going to commit and go through all four books, <laughs> um, even though the next two are going to be probably decidedly different from the the first two. Um, either that or it'll be some sort of thing in reverse. Um, yeah, there's been a substantial number of developments at the end of this book. Um, things that I did not expect, things that I did expect... Uh, a lot of twists and turns and a lot of them revolving around a couple of characters that were way more important than we actually probably thought they were. Um, but yeah, so we're going to get right into it. So I don't remember exactly what it is that I uh, talked about last time, but this time we, so I might repeat myself a couple times, but in the interest of it being the end of the book, I am going to kind of go through everything. So last time, and as usual, we'll start out with uh, Kassad. So we had thought that he was dead, and we were indeed correct. Kassad is dead. <laughs> you all thought I was going to say, nah, he's alive. No, Kassad is definitely dead. Um, but at the end of his life, there is a pretty big plot twist that I think will take up a substantial amount of talking time for this particular episode. Um we find out who Moneta is. And I'm sure we've all had a lot of suspicions. Um, I thought Moneta could be the child of Johnny and Braun. I thought that Moneta could be just some person from the future. Um, I was wrong on one account, but right on another. She is obviously someone from the future. But the person who she is from the future is someone who we've been familiar with the entire time. And that is... Drum roll, Rachel Weintraub. So it's very uh, – when Kassad goes to die, he asks Moneta what, his re what her real name is. And she says, I'm not known by Moneta just yet, but I am known by blank. And so, uh, Kassad cries, and then I think he proceeds to die right after that. And we don't know who it is. And then there's like five more chapters until we figure out who it is. Um, but – it is Rachel Weintraub. So Moneta has been Rachel this entire time, which really good, uh, really good way to write that in. Dan Simmons, congratulations. I did not catch that. Um, there were some, maybe some indications there, but I think that, uh, that overall he did a really good job of kind of obscuring the fact that Rachel Weintraub was Moneta. Uh, she, Definitely seems to have a type. Um, Kassad and uh, Emilio are very similar in their drive and passions um, and kind of in their demeanors as well, which I found to be interesting. I like that there's consistency in her character development in that way. So what we find out is that uh, Rachel Weintraub is Moneta and... I'm just going to kind of like skip over a few things and we'll go back to them so that we can talk more about this. But Rachel Weintraub, a.k.a. Moneta, 
uh, interacts with pretty much everybody except for the console in the last few bits of the – actually, even the console, too, in the last few bits of the um, the novel. And in some interesting way and a really meaningful way, she's kind of like a the glue that holds the group together. She's the reason that the console is so concerned with making it back to the group because he ha- believes that he has – um you know, an obligation to Weintraub, and he wants to see that particular part of the journey through to its fruition. Weintraub is only at the tombs because he's waiting for Rachel after having uh, given her to the Shrike per her request. And then uh, Bron Lamia, Martin Salinas, uh, Kassad, all of them are very, and DeRay even, are very concerned with the outcome of the uh, Weintraub arc, if you will. And I think that one of the main reasons that we kind of are focused on this, or Simmons chooses to focus on this in particular, is because uh, Rachel kind of represents this very interesting anomaly in everything that's happening around them of this like return to innocence in some capacity, because she's aging in reverse. And because of this return to innocence, we get this like socially obligated parental energy from all of the characters involved in the story. And so the console, Selena's everybody are very invested in the outcome of her, of her situation as far as the Merlin sickness is concerned. Now you may be wondering how do we get from Weintraub giving her up to the, um, the Shrike to uh, finding out that she lives not only like, lives but lives so far into the future that she's actually able to become a controller of the shrike and we have johnny to thank for that so we learn that johnny dies um or not johnny rather uh severin we learn that severin dies on old earth which has been relocated to some new place that nobody knows exactly in the galaxy where it is um and uh, when he dies there, um, I cannot remember, Lee Hunt, that's his name. <laughs> Gosh darn it. If I have any more sentences to start with, I can't remember their name. <laughs> Lee Hunt, the primary advisor to Gladstone, becomes one of the, like, the main character in uh, Severin's story. And as he goes to his death, his biological death, the death of his body and not of his persona, he kind of begins to view uh, Hunt as the Severin figure. So Jonathan Severin was John Keats' like friend and caretaker at the end of his life. And he was also a very devoutly religious man who tried to convert Keats to Catholicism or Christianity, and Keats could not or would not, rather, convert. And so that was a point of conflict between the two of them, though I don't know if I would call it conflict Towards the end of his life, I think Keats may have converted. I'm not totally sure. But if he did, it was because of Severin. And so Severin is this important figure. So when the new Keats persona, who is Severin, realizes that he's pretty much, he is John Keats, then Lee Hunt kind of takes that Severin persona and cares for him and is sacrificial towards him and just really like has a powerful bond with him. And when he dies, he buries his body according to Severin's instructions, despite the fact that the Shrike is watching the entire time. And there's like this horse that knows exactly where it's supposed to go and what it's supposed to do, which I found to be very interesting because like there's no other people on old earth supposedly with, um, with Hunt and Severin. And after, uh, Severin dies, what the well actually during the process of Severn dying there's a bunch of like biblical type allusions um lee hunt uh slaps the horse as it's moving because he wants it to go faster and there's a specific story in the bible where there's a prophet who uh smacks his donkey and it ends up being like this big thing about like patience and taking care of animals and things that take care of you and treating your neighbor well and things like that standard but biblical parable type things and so it's funny that that was referenced in there um especially because that i think that donkey is uh that story with the donkey is on the same road that jesus takes to um 
Bethlehem or Damascus or something like that. It's it's a it's a setting that is repeated throughout the Bible. And so he buries him and he says, here lies a man whose name is written in water. Um, and for the entirety of Severin's death process, he's quoting directly from uh, Ode to a Gratian Urn, which I think is by Keats. I'd have to Google that, which I'm not going to do right now because I'm in the middle of recording. But Ode to a Gratian Urn is like a classic turn-of-the-century poem that I believe is by John Keats or somebody who affiliated with John Keats. And the whole point of it is just kind of like we are transitioning from this time of antiquity and from glorifying all these ideas and what was the point of glorifying them and what is the point of life, what is the point of death. Very powerful poem. I highly recommend it. Um, But, yeah, it's pretty much – it's not quoted verbatim, but there's like slight variations that basically are equivalent to it. A lot of it has to do with erasing history and – like figuring out how it is that the dead deserve to be remembered or honored. And so I thought that was really cool that that was included in there. Um, after Severin dies, uh, Hunt goes to the Colosseum because they're in Rome and sees a giant Farcaster portal that he cannot enter, um, which will come into play towards the end of the story and we'll get there. Don't worry. Um, but yeah, he gets, he gets, he finds a portal but can't go through it because all he wants to do is return to the web because he doesn't know what's going on and nobody really does except for, uh, Severin who's been able to visit people in their dreams. And how does that all tie in with Rachel Weintraub? Well, here we go. So Severin dies and is then, his persona is trapped in the data sphere slash megasphere slash metasphere. And if we remember from the last episode, I talked about how the metasphere is where the beings of collective consciousness reside. And so it's kind of like the realm of the gods, if you will. Um, Severin is terrified of this place. It's part of the reason why when he goes to die and he is offered, um, like de- he's offered to be deified, um, he chooses not to. He chooses instead to take the role of like John the Baptist, where he uh, is more of the harbinger for the one to come rather than the one to come. And so there's uh, some hypothesis as to who that would be, because it's basically going to be the person who bridges the gap between a machine AI existence and an organic existence. That's basically the perfect fruition of what the Technocore was trying to achieve with Cybrids. But when Johnny dies, or sorry, when Severin dies, he's able to interact with pretty much the entire universe in some capacity, very much in a similar way to a god, but more like a, a demigod rather than a god god, I would, I guess I would kind of phrase it. So he travels immediately to Hyperion at the time of which, or at the time during which um, Weintraub has given up his daughter to the Shrike, and Severin takes Rachel Weintraub from the Shrike and gives her back to uh, Weintraub at some point. But I don't know exactly how the times line up there. But yeah, he takes Rachel from the Shrike, um, and that is, you know, a very important plot point. Now, this all correlates with another thing that's going on with Braun Lamia. And Martin Silenus. So if you remember from the last episode, I was talking about how Bron Lamia had gone to the Palace of the Shrike and kind of was able to see it for what it really is. It's this giant, um, I guess, building where everybody who's in it is hooked up to a like the same uh, umbilical cord that Bron Lamia was hooked up to in the Sphinx. But they're hooked up to that in order to get them on the Tree of the Shrike. And the Tree of the Shrike, we find out, is supposed to be like a giant pain magnet for the empathy portion of the triune human god that the mechanical god is currently at war with. So the Tree of Pain is supposed to draw out that empathy portion of that god, but what the mechanical god doesn't understand is that that empathy portion occupies every individual And so it cannot be centralized, and so it will draw certain things or people to it, but not the unit as a whole or the the thing as a whole. And so when Lamia finds Silenus, she frees him, and he is alive. Well, when he wakes up, he says, you know, the Shrike is right behind you, right? 
and the chapter cuts there. We get like literally six more cha- or two more chapters, which ends up being like three hours worth of uh, listening before we get back to what happens with them. And what happens with them is that Bron Lamia, uh, actually, you know what? We're, we're going to do that right after this break. I kind of lost track of time. So we're going to take a quick break and then I'll tell you what happens with Bron Lamia and Silenus. Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on twitter visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info I'm really not sorry about it. Uh, <laughs> Dan Simmons did it to me, so now I'm doing it to all of you. And if you read the book, then you wouldn't be left on a cliffhanger because you'd know exactly what I'm going to say next. Or I guess maybe. I don't know. I mean, I like to think these discussions are purposeful for people who've still read the book just because I thoroughly enjoyed doing them. This book was incredible. So, yeah, so John Severin uh, uh, is uh, has gotten Rachel Weintraub um, and then... Uh, Bron Lamia has rescued um, Martin Silenus, which we did not think that she would do, most likely. At least I definitely didn't think that she was going to do that ever um, until she went back to the Shrike Palace specifically looking for him, in which case I was like, okay, well, if he's there, then she's rescuing him. So, whatever. Um, Silenus wakes up, says, there's the Shrike. Bron Lamia turns around and then apparently starts to, like, walk on air. Literally, and then just shatters the Shrike, destroys it completely, um, without really doing much at all. I think she kicks it, and it just like shatters into a million pieces. And so Silenus is like, "Oh, well, hello, Beowulf," <laughs> because the Shrike has been referred to as the Grendel of Hyperion for like the entire two books, and so I am. You know, I'm surprised that that kind of like circled around, of course. Um, that's, I guess, relatively, it's to be expected in some capacities. Um, so, yeah, the Shrike, at least that particular Shrike, is gone. Gonzo. Um, yeah, weird, for sure. So, Lamia escapes with Silenus, who can barely walk because he has been experiencing the Tree of Thorns for gosh knows how long um it's a synthetic reality so in some capacity uh he was actually on the tree of thorns and in other capacities he was not actually on the tree of thorns and uh there's really no like time he specifically mentions as he's on the tree that there is no referent there's no reference by which he can acquire how much time he's been on the tree. It just feels like an eternity. And so everyone who's on that tree, you know, it feels that particular way. Um, which I find it interesting that, uh, after the Shrike is destroyed, it doesn't like kind of like ruin the illusion of the Shrike palace and allow for them to rescue a bunch of other people who are also permanently hooked up to being on the tree because sad King Billy's on that tree. And what that says to me is that like, the umbilical cord that you're attached to that, uh, which I think it's interesting that they use umbilical cord as if like the mother of uh, humanity is pain, which I think is a very interesting uh, take on religion and on a number of other things. Um, so, but that's neither, that's neither here nor there specifically or particularly. Um, regardless uh i would have liked to see them be able to rescue some other people i think that could have been potentially really cool but um yeah so they escape they get back to weintraub 
And then uh, as they get back to Weintraub, the, I think the timeline is where is that the console also comes back, which is weird because the console left like what seems to be an eternity ago, but is able to like go meet the ousters and then come back in a relatively quick amount of time. Um, actually in a very fast amount of time. I guess we should kind of resolve where the console stands. So uh, I think last time I had mentioned that he is not absolved of his sins necessarily, but he is punished to live on. And so, and of course the Elaine and Emilio Cortez are not um, necessarily privy to uh, like any punishment from the ousters. The ousters are actually... It seems like the ousters are kind of concerned with making sure that everybody lives as much as possible. It seems like they kind of have a true value for life that goes beyond what the rest of the hegemony has as far as a value for life is concerned, which I think is interesting because the web and the hegemony refer to the ousters as savages um, and as individuals who like mutate their body exclusively for the purposes of war. But what we find out as the book is ending is that a lot of the mutations that are brought into the fold of the human genome by the ousters and their scientists are for the purpose of terraforming planets that have no life on them rather than terraforming planets that already have life on them. Another interesting thing that we find out uh, in this particular or in the this last section is that the cruciforms were actually created by the uh, the core. And so that was a big twist that kind of gets almost overlooked <laughs> in some capacities. Um, the cruciforms were intent, their intended purpose was to perpetuate the existence of a small group of humans from which the core could continue to harvest the necessary computing power of biological neurons in order to perpetuate their existence and advance their evolution. And so it didn't matter necessarily how capable of thought the individuals that were constantly reincarnated reincarnated actually were what mattered was that they had the actual biological brain mass of available to the core and so the pakora the ones way back from the very first chapter of hyperion are actually in there uh from that potential future and what i think is kind of um What's happening with, as far as the time travel is concerned with this whole novel is that all possible universes exist in some capacity, at, but they only exist in the future and not necessarily in the present. And so because they only exist in the future and not in the present, all possible futures exist and therefore the present experiences all possible futures before the future that is actually going to exist comes to fruition. Or alternatively, all possible futures exist. No, no, that would be the right way to phrase it. Yeah, so all according to Simmons and in this book, all possible futures exist, including the futures in which uh, the pilgrimage is unable to get the information back to Gladstone, the death bomb goes off, and everybody who's in the tombs is implanted with a cruciform and the cruciforms permanently revive them and keep them alive indefinitely, basically as like underground little thought slaves um, to the core and their needs. So kind of like the Matrix in some capacity, but much worse because there isn't even a false reality for them to live in. The Matrix would be kind of like uh, the Tree of Thorns, except for instead of living a full life, you just live one thing for eternity, which would just really suck. <laughs> so, yeah. So, that's that's the uh the tree of thorns um and all of those things uh and the cruciform like I said made by the the techno core um very ingenious idea in in my opinion. Um I I really love the fact that we find out that the Technocore is the one behind or are the ones behind the cruciforms and that the Pakora are a result of the Technocore's desire to basically enslave humanity and reverse their evolution in some capacity. And it also makes so much more sense as to why uh Hoyt and Lenar or Hoyt and uh, Duray would view the um 
cruciform as a curse rather than as any kind of blessing in any capacity, especially since every time they get revived, they get closer and closer to what the Pecora are, which are just basically thoughtless, sexless, listless uh, entities, vessels for a brain that doesn't function uh, effectively, basically. And so all of that happens. Now, what we also find out is that I had mentioned that we find out that the Technocore exists within the Farcaster network, like a bunch of spiders in a web or rats in a wall is kind of the way, the metaphor that's used. And so ultimately, uh, now we're going to get back to Mayna Gladstone and what it is that she's been up to this entire time. So, of course, when the planets start getting destroyed outright, we find out that it is not, in fact, the ousters who are attacking those planets. The ousters tell the consul, we're not the ones making these attacks during their war council. I don't know if I mentioned that last week. If not, hey, big twist. The ousters, when they meet with the consul, say, the only planet we're trying to take is Hyperion. And it's just because it's important for the future. And y'all don't understand it just yet. But we do because we've been out in space. And in space, time is relative. So maybe we've experienced something or they have access to something or what have you. I hope that that gets explained later on. Um yeah, but I guess before we get to that, I should all resolve that whole stuff with Rachel Weintraub. So after everybody gets back from the, so the console comes back and he meets Weintraub and Silenus and Lamia all at the time tombs. And when they're at the time tombs, future Rachel, aka Moneta, appears and basically kind of like gives them all of the information that they needed to know in order to understand what it was that was going on. She tells them that she is Moneta. She tells. Uh, wine, Saul Weintraub that, um, or she gives, she's the one who gives Saul Weintraub back the baby, Rachel Weintraub, and then says, hey, by the way, um, I'm not asking you to do this, but someone needs to raise this child because it's going to age normally now. And if you raise it normally, then it's going to turn into me. And so, like, I shouldn't be here, but I kind of am here because, I don't know, she says something about a time travel council or a future council or a past council. So the implication there is that Moneta is from some potential future where time travel has been achieved by the human race in order to interact with the past in some capacity. And so she basically enlightens everybody, tells uh, Bron Lamia how important the child is that she's carrying. She t- asks uh, Saul Weintraub to basically raise her again. But he has to do it someplace else. So he has to like leave the group and doesn't really say where he ends up going, which I find to be very interesting. I have a feeling that based off of the ending of this book, the next couple books will probably have him pretty heavily involved as well as uh, Rachel Weintraub's new upbringing pretty heavily involved. Um, I imagine those books are going to play with time even more than these books did. Uh, Simmons has done a really good job of being at least somewhat consistent. I know that writing time travel stuff is nigh impossible quite frequently, so that can be really frustrating um, for writers and for readers as well. So, yeah, Rachel Weintraub, a.k.a. Moneta, comes back from the future, tells everybody what's going on, um, thanks everybody for everything that they did, kind of, and then basically says she has to go, and then uh, Saul Weintraub also vanishes with baby Rachel into some undetermined spot in the future or in space time or what have you that nobody knows where he ends up. So that's kind of the resolution with the pilgrimage, at least for the time being. So all that to say, the following people are dead. Um, Het Mestin, uh, Lenar Hoyt, and um, General Fedmat Kassad. Alive are the Consul, Bron Lamia, Saul Weintraub, Martin Silenus, and I think that's four out of the seven. So, and then of course we get DeRay, but he's not necessarily a part of the original group that was sent to Hyperion. So, all of those guys are alive, they're still on Hyperion, and they're going to be stuck there because, flashback to Mana Gladstone, which I was talking about just a minute ago, Mana Gladstone gets the information from the consul, or from Theo Lane, rather, that it is not the ouster fleet that is attacking and destroying planets. And she's like, okay, well then what the heck, it must be the Technocore. She then gets a, a fat line from 
the one of the people, the guy who she had promoted for speaking up in the meeting, even though his seniors told him not to. She gets a fat line from him, and he basically says, hey, look, we captured a ship of the ousters, and we're trying to dissect this ouster. And they cut it open, and it is not an ouster. It's like it just like flashes bright white light and then heals itself kind of a thing. So it's very obviously the techno core that is doing this. So now it is of the utmost importance that Mayna Gladstone knows where the core is. And she decides that it is time for them to sever the cord between the core and human beings. And the cord that is tying them together is the Farcaster Network, which is kind of representative of the uh, apex of technology because it's like instantaneous travel amongst worlds and all sorts of things. And so Gladstone sends out a giant transmission that says, hey, Farcasters are done. We're destroying them all. Everybody freaks out. And then Mana Gladstone blows up every Farcaster in the network all over. And we're going to talk about what the results of that are right after this next quick commercial break. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Packed ending of Fall of Hyperion. Uh, so right before the break, I was talking about what was going on with Mena Gladstone and the rest of the uh, the web, I guess, uh, all of human existence in this particular book, um, and kind of talking about how uh, that is going for them. <laughs> The answer is not well. So Gladstone decides she's going to destroy the entire Far- Farcaster network. Because the Farcaster network, while it is the thing that has bound people together because of its ability to allow people to instantaneously travel from one place to another, the unfortunate reality of it is that that is kind of... Um, it's not God... It's not godlike in some capacity. Um, and I think that there's, uh, this is where like one of the main dichotomies that has kind of been like subtly happening behind the scenes throughout the entirety of these books is, is where, this is where it occurs primarily. Um, there is a dichotomy between what is divine and what is human or machine. And so, uh, and ultimately, I think machine is just kind of like a derivative of human, according to um, Simmons. So the reason or my reasoning behind this, as I'm sure you're all wondering, how did I draw this conclusion, um, is that there's a bunch of reference that is made by individuals from the future, by people from the techno core, by the Church of the Shrike, that humanity has accrued some sort of gigantic debt that needs to be repaid in some capacity. And there's this reference throughout the novel to this idea of time debt, where if you travel from one planet to another, you accrue a time debt that is different than the time that you experience. So you'll age at a different rate than, like, let's say you have a wife on a planet. If you accrue a five-year time debt, she will have aged five years further than you will have in uh, the same amount of experiential time. And so there's just like this weird relativity that happens there. And so because of the Farcaster network, 
individuals are able to bypass that time debt that would normally be accrued from traveling through space. In addition, the human human race has basically wiped out almost every form of intelligent life that it's ever run into on any planet that it has terraformed. And it hasn't been terraforming planets that were um, uninhabited. It was terraforming planets, or they were terraforming planets that were inhabited by like somewhat intelligent life. There's a mention of the fact that there were centaurs on Mars. Um, centaurs on Mars. Centaurs? I don't know. But there were, cent- there, you know, half human, half horse people on Mars. And that all of those individuals or those creatures were wiped out when Mars was colonized. And then there's the modal islands on Maui Covenant. Those were semi-sentient beings. The dolphins that were brought from Earth were considered by Simmons in this novel for the purposes of the novel to have semi-sentience and have the potential to evolve into an intelligent life form. And so there's been this massive amount of debt and blood accrued by the human race between time, space, and matter um, that needs to be repaid. And the Shrike is kind of supposed to represent that final atonement because it's the creation of humans that is able to achieve the thing that humans have been trying to prevent all other creation from achieving, whether it's consciously or subconsciously. And so those things will, that thing is the thing that will provide the reconciliation of the, uh, you know, they will, uh, I guess, collect on the debt, if you will. And so uh, when Gladstone decides to blow up the uh, forecasting network, I think it's kind of supposed to be indicative of the fact that, like, no matter how much progress we is, it is that we think we've made, there's always a cost to it. And what is the cost? Is the cost eventually going to be worth, in this case, the entirety of humanity? Is the cost worth our souls? I think is kind of what Simmons is trying to get at. And for such a basic thing, you know, are the consequences of the action, you know, or are the, um, do the ends just to find the means is such a simple question. To kind of just propose, but for Simmons to propose it in such an advanced way when we've got this like just light years of cognitive distance away from the interactions that we have on our, on a daily basis, for him to kind of like literally basically just have us look at technology and say, was this bit of technology, was this convenience, was this this connectivity between us and another human being, was it worth it? Is it worth dying for? And ultimately, Gladstone has to say, like, I'm going to betray the whole human race and, like, literally leave entire planets that whose economy rely exclusively on the fact that forecasters exist, leave those planets to die. Because there are, like, urban planets that have no farming and don't have the ability to farm where there's not going to be any food. And, like, billions and billions of people are, will will die either, like, from starvation, a number of people die because they're in the middle of Farcaster portals when they all get shut off, so they just, like, freeze in the vastness of space. Or they get, like, arms and legs chopped off as the portals close. And so the consequences are pretty widespread from this action that Gladstone takes. This is also, like, the last thing that she does um, as CEO. Uh, Gorbachev... I think is the guy's name or something like that. It's probably not Gorbachev because I know that's a real-life politician um, or was a real-life politician. Regardless, um, Gorbachev is the one who – the Russian gentleman, Russian-sounding gentleman, is the one who takes over the um, – the what's it called? Uh, The web or the hegemony or at least what's left of it because really the only thing that's left for him to – rule is or to run i guess rule is probably the wrong word the only thing left for him to run is uh tau city center which is the planet that they're on because as soon as the farcaster portals are destroyed now everybody is pretty much isolated from each other in every regard except for one line of communication which they call fat line and fat line is the specific frequency or like wavelength that humans were able to access on their own through their own research that allows for relatively instantaneous communication between like over vast distances. So fat line is the one form of communication that the techno core isn't really involved in. And that's why fat line can go through the anti-entropic fields at, um, or on Hyperion. It's why fat line can go from Manic Gladstone on Tau city center to the console 
out on Hyperion without the core necessarily knowing that it is going there, knowing that it's going. That's funny. Um, so what we find out, though, is that fat line is equ- the fat line frequency is equivalent to the idea of the void that binds. And if you remember correctly, the triune god of the humans is the void that binds empathy and intellect. And so the void that binds is... Um, that is essentially equivalent to fat line because it is all of the space and time through which communication has to travel. And so when we get to the end of the book, the fat line frequency no longer works. There's a voice that comes out over the top of the fat line frequency that says like, for now this doesn't work. And then all communication goes dead. And so and the fat line is supposed to be like an absolutely, like impeccable form of communication. It can't be interfered with. It can't be hacked. It can't be listened in on. Like it's all encoded in very specific ways. And so the fact that it just no longer works for no reason is very indicative of the fact that like in Simmons novel, there is, there are gods in some capacity or there are things or beings in the universe that can operate outside of the realm of what would be considered logical to that universe. And I think that that, for you know, in my opinion, I think that's super freaking cool, um, but that's neither here nor there necessarily. But overall, um, I think the big takeaway from that we were talking about the separation between divine and human. Um, now there is a, a refocusing in the novel on what it is to be human and what it is to be involved with the people who are immediately in your vicinity. And I think that in some capacity, the punishment of not being able to communicate across the galaxy previously is part of the atonement. Because it feels like there's some sort of necessary karmic cycle or something like that that's happening in this novel to where there's no way for you to not end up in a situation where you are beholden to something or some one for the consequences of your actions. And so Gladstone, of course, is removed from power. She sends out a last couple messages, basically saying, I am making the decision to blow up all of the forecasting networks. You have like 10 seconds before it all blows up. And in that span, uh, Lenar or Father DeRay was supposed to go back to Pacha, but did not because he was visited in, his, in a dream by Severin. So Severin saves uh, DeRay's life by not letting him go through the Farcaster when the Farcasters blow up. So DeRay gets to live because of Severn visiting him in a dream. And that is one of the other things that Severn kind of does is like resolve all of these kind of like loose ends. So if you remember, DeRay is the Pope. He gets, uh, he's unable to return to the Vatican, but he's still the Pope. But then the communication cuts out, so he's not the Pope. But then there's rumors of a new Pope. I don't know. There's, there's a little bit of confusion at the end of the book in this regard. But as far as the government and the hegemony and all of that is concerned, Um, for all effective intents and purposes, the hegemony no longer exists. So the, the way in which people have lived before has been permanently altered by that. And when the far casting network is destroyed, it also destroys the techno core in some capacity. Now we don't know if the techno core still exists somehow in some sort of like small amount I would imagine that the machine god of the techno core still exists in some way. And because um, I've kind of mentioned this idea that um, because a, a god is created by, in according to Simmons, god, a god is created by the power of a collective consciousness. When it becomes, or as soon as it becomes or comes into existence, it simultaneously exists as its final iteration as, and as its current iteration. Because it will eventually evolve into the final iteration of perfection, which other creatures are not able to do. And so in the fact that it can exist in a final form of perfection that exists outside of time and space, when it initially is brought into being, it simultaneously exists as perfect and imperfect. And I would wager to guess that the techno core machine God does the same thing. And so I don't think that there's necessarily a way for humans to get rid of it because at some point it existed therefore it will always exist and i think that that is kind of a metaphor in some capacities for the way in which religion or god exists to simmons in society 
because I don't think that it's necessarily true that Simmons would cl- identify himself as a theist or claim that this is what he thinks of actual God. I think that it's just a theory that is kind of being proposed um, in an interesting and unique way that is going to kind of like help us to understand the story more, help us to understand the universe and in mainly get us to think about the way in which we think about God. And that is one of the main reasons why I've loved this book so much is that the cognitive distance that's created by the effective writing of Simmons is just profoundly impactful and thoughtful or thought provoking rather in regards to how it is that we view God and we view religion He's constantly talking about how if religion is going to survive, it has to find a way to evolve. And because it has to find a way to evolve, that implies that, like, God evolves in some capacity. Um, At least I think that's kind of what Simmons is trying to say because uh, that was one of DeRay's, um, like, main reasons or main belief structures. There's a specific saint um, whose name is escaping me right now. who DeRay kind of like follows or believes in, I guess, that's proposed that God evolves alongside its creation. And so that's been kind of an important theme for us to remember as we've been going throughout this book. And so I think that Simmons is trying to convince us as individuals like, hey, maybe this is a way in which God could exist in a capacity that we could find more acceptable and that would allow us to behave in ways that are more prosperous for us as a species and as individuals so really really have enjoyed that portion of the book so that kind of wraps it up with gladstone and the hegemony so we're going to just kind of go through what the epilogue has to say and i'm going to kind of hypothesize what the next couple books are going to be about and all of that will be right after this last commercial break Watching TV has changed over time. Streaming has become the new norm. That's why Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast dives headfirst to the world of cord cutting. Want to be on the loop of what's hot in Netflix? Or if it's not a preference, what about original shows in Hulu? We've got you covered. Join us as we fill in the blanks and talk about movies to stream and what show you should be binging. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. finally going to talk about the actual end of the fall of hyperion uh, <laughs> yeah so right before the break i just kind of wrapped up uh everything that was in the book proper and now we get to go into the epilogue which will hopefully maybe give us some indication as to what it is the rest of the series could possibly be about because it feels like pretty much everything's been wrapped up in some capacity all of the pilgrims have kind of either um, I guess they, they've all ended up back on Hyperion. Um, the ones that were going to die, died. The ones that were going to live, lived. Man of Gladstone, uh, effectively destroyed the techno core by blowing up all of the, um, Farcaster portals, thus destroying the Farcaster network, which destroyed the techno core's ability to harness the energy of the universe of human beings and their cognitive processing power, I guess, as well as, like, all of the data sphere and all that. So everything's done, effectively. So what's in the epilogue? Um, stuff. That's what's in the epilogue. <laughs> so um, the epilogue kind of opens, and uh, it's everybody back on Hyperion. They're all having a little party, which I think is funny. It almost, you know, in the first book, they, the epilogue was basically kind of like um, the beginning of The Wizard of Oz. And uh, what's funny is the epilogue in this book is kind of like the end of Wizard of Oz in this, a lot of ways, including the way in which they play Somewhere Over the Rainbow, um, which is very sweet. So 
this is kind of like one of the first times in the book that we actually get to see a lot of like personalities on display in like a social setting where there's no like motivations outside of just interacting with each other and having a good time. So that was nice and very pleasant. So the epilogue sees everybody on Hyperion, I think like three years or five years, maybe even longer than that in the future. Uh, Saul Weintraub has been gone the entire time. Nobody has seen him. Uh, the time tombs are behaving just as oddly as they always have, but now there's a couple of new there's a couple of new features. So the door to the Sphinx has been pretty much closed, except for to like a select few that get to go through it. My guess is that the Sphinx is some sort of like thing from the future that was made by the same people who have that like future timeline that Rachel Weintraub is occupying. Um, yeah, so my guess would be that uh, they are uh, interacting with the past by uh, using the Sphinx, and so they only let certain people through based on who they've decided they're going to let through, um, which, you know, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that we're getting another good book for sure or anything like that. Um, I did just find that kind of interesting. And then uh, let's see, what else do we got going on? Everybody's kind of having a party because the consul has decided that he is going to take a journey somewhere. Um, I don't remember if it says specifically where it is that he's going. I think uh, the goal is for him to find Mana Gladstone, go back to um, the web and just kind of rendezvous. And figure out what exactly is going on there in some capacity, because pretty much everybody is curious. Um, except for maybe Silenus, he is not curious in the slightest. Um, he, uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know why I said he, uh, that <laughs> Silenus isn't necessarily all that relevant. But the consul has decided to go back along with Theo Lane. Emilio Arendez is looking to go back to see his, or to his family. Um, and since the console is the only one with real, like, a uh, interstellar space travel capabilities, that's where he's going. Uh, Bron Lamia has decided to stay on Hyperion, as has Silenus. Um, let's see who else was alive. That's one, two, three. Um, Silenus, Bron Lamia, the console. Why am I missing who? Oh, Weintraub's already gone. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> Silenus and um, Lamia are staying on Hyperion. Weintraub's gone. The console is leaving. They're throwing a big party. Things have kind of gone back to normal. The Shrike hasn't appeared for, I want to say, years. Um, and uh, Silenus says even if the Shrike did appear, then Bron Lamia would be able to just turn it into glass and shatter it like she did the last time, which is kind of an interesting thing. And then it gets brought up that uh, Severin, Jonathan Severin, appeared to everybody in their dreams, including the console, <clears throat> except for Bron Lamia. And so Bron Lamia is very disappointed by this because, as we know, the father of her child is the original Keats persona. So in some capacity, seeing um, Jonathan Severin, I think, would bring her a little bit of closure or something like that so that she could feel a bit better about the situation, if I had to guess. Um, I would wager that, you know, she's not feeling super happy about the fact that she's going to be raising this child by its, by herself, um, without, you know, Jonathan Keats having the potential to be involved at all. But when she's on her way back to the, uh, to her house, she decides to stop in the gardens. And I'm pretty sure these gardens are like a direct reference to the gardens where Jesus walks around before he's crucified because in the garden Jonathan Severn appears to Bron Lamia where she proceeds to say you're not real and tries to touch him and then her hands go through him which is another biblical reference because when Jesus comes back from dying nobody believes that it's really him and he says here stick your fingers in my wounds I promise it's me that kind of a thing so uh, that is what happens with Severn he proceeds to tell her that he is uh, he has refused the Messiah title, and he says he's the one who's supposed to be the kind of like the the waymaker, if you will, for the uh, the 
the Messiah, so he's more of a John the Baptist, which, knowing this book, he'll end up beheaded in some sort of metaphoric way, um, though he kind of already was. Uh, he kind of already was killed by the Shrike, which I find to be interesting. That could be kind of a good reference to uh, John the Baptist, because John the Baptist's head is ultimately chopped off um, by somebody's wife, whose name I can't remember right now. But it's not necessarily super important. Um, well, I mean, it is relatively important. <laughs> But regardless, um, he basically tells Bronlamia that the child that she's carrying is in fact the Messiah. She tells her, her he tells her that, um, well, I mean, not the Messiah, but this God figure, this, this connected thing between machine mind and human mind. And then he also tells her that he had no interference with the Shrike when she, uh, destroyed it, which to her, of course, is weird because, she didn't know that she had special powers in any capacity. So there's also a potential kind of hint that it was the child. Um, again, if this child exists as some sort of like perfect being, then it would exist like simultaneously in its juvenile form and in its adult form. Because if it existed at any point in time during which it could travel back in time, it would exist in that capacity at all times because the final eventuality of its being would be able to exist cohesively with the current eventuality of its being complicated i know so severin reveals that um they have a little bit of a discussion um just kind of about like the general future of things and where jonathan severin is about the metasphere about whether or not the techno core is still around which he doesn't believe that they are um and whether and, and where he's going to go from there um, because he's not ready to go into the Metasphere and exist there permanently. Uh, so Bron Lamia makes suggestions about, well, why don't you occupy all these other places with AIs? And eventually, they land on him occupying the AI in the console ship, which uh, allows for like one of the first funny anecdotes of the entire book to where um, the console will ask the ship's AI to do something, and it will respond in verse from John Keats' poems which I think is hilarious. Martin Silenus, uh, is it Martin Silenus or Bron Lamia ends the book by reading The Fall of Hyperion, which is part of the incomplete Hyperion Cantos by Jonathan Keats. And that's pretty much it. Um, I think that about covers everything. <laughs> this book was really dense, um, and it's hard to know whether or not I covered everything that I wanted to cover. It has a lot of commentary on, like, religious ideas, on spirituality, and other things that are, I, I don't want to say relevant, but they're relevant to, like, everyday examinations that we have of what it looks like for us to exist in the universe that we exist in. So, I think that it's, this book is definitely a good sequel to the first um, and I have no idea what he's going to talk about in the next book, which I think is called Rise of Endymion, Endymion or uh, Rise of Endymion, or Di Endymion, I don't even know. Um, if I had to guess, Endymion is the uh, child that Bron Lamia conceived with, um, with the original Keats persona. And Demian could also be the uh, name of the machine god. And the book could be about how that came about. Um, I am going to be reading it and talking about it on the podcast. So I don't want to like spend too much time hypothesizing about what it could possibly be about. So as far as the fall of Hyperion is concerned compared to the first book... The first book had a much more, it felt, cohesive message that it was trying to send about the human condition. This one in particular felt like it was a little bit more socially uh, focused on its commentary. It dealt a lot with the way in which people handle political strife as well as conflict as, on like a scale larger than just like local conflict. I was relatively impressed with its execution. The, the diction, the syntax, everything in this book are impeccable, just like in the first one. Stylistically, uh, it helped me to understand Dan Simmons stylistically a little bit more, just because the first book was so 
focused on being sure that it was emulating the um the Canterbury tales that I think that it kind of obscured a little bit of what it is that Dan Simmons would normally do in a novel, which is fine. Um, I really appreciated what it was that he was doing with that first book and it absolutely stands on its own. You don't need to read the second or even the third of the fourth books. Really? Um, I think the first two by themselves would be more than enough if you wanted to stop there. Uh, there's some interesting cliffhangers and Simmons has done a good job of kind of like teasing things that we could want more of. But I think that it's interesting that he kind of brings 99% of the conflict to a close in this book. Um, but I think that the reason that there's like still potential for more or that there even are more books is because of the idea of playing with time so much and the way that it's like cyclical and linear simultaneously simultaneously just makes it a really effective medium or universe rather for Simmons to operate in and write lots of interesting stories in. So I am looking forward to reading the third and fourth books. Again, I am curious what they'll be about. I hope that they'll include some of the original characters. I definitely grew in fondness for all of the characters, even Silenus at the end of the book. Um, I actually kind of liked him as a character because he, he kind of, uh, he tells Braun how much he appreciates her. She asks him if he was really on the tree, and he says it doesn't really matter if I was really on it. I felt like I was really on it. So I was both really on it and not really on it. And that's, I think that's kind of somewhat of the message of this book as well. There's a lot of different messages in this book, and you should definitely check it out. I'm looking forward to talking about the next book in the series in the next few days. So look forward for that. That's all I've got for you guys today. Thank you for listening. Appreciate it if you guys would leave a review or a comment or what have you. Follow us, like us, or on Twitter, Facebook, all that good stuff. So thank you guys for joining me. Stay safe out there, and we'll be back uh, on Wednesday to talk some more about A Scanner Darkly, and next weekend we'll get started on Endymion or The Rise of Endymion. I can't remember which one it is. So thanks again for listening, everybody. Have a good day. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network, from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program